Farming the future and co-creation, a theme we've already had in the opening ceremony. We're going to go into a panel discussion about what that means exactly from leaders here in the horticulture sector in the Netherlands. But I'm very pleased first to have a guest to tell us all about it and give us some perspective from the Ministry of Agriculture here in the Netherlands, Michael van Erkel. Michael, a warm welcome. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. You're the Director of International Agri-Business and Food Security at the Ministry. Yes. yes. And it's a pleasure to have you uh, with us here at Green Tech. And I'll give the floor to you. Thank you, Andrew. Well, it's a great pleasure for me to be here, ladies and gentlemen, viewers, listeners. Um, great pleasure to stand here live in front of you at the Green Tech, the official opening day. Uh, this wonderful global meeting for all who are involved in the horticultural technology. The world is facing several global challenges, and these have only been put under a magnifying glass by the pre present COVID-19 pandemic. The necessity to feed growing a population with high quality and nutritious food, whilst at the same time preserving and restoring nature, soil and biodiversity has become even more clear. We also have witnessed stronger awareness amongst consumers. Where and how is my food grown, produced, processed and distributed? In 2018, the Ministry of Agriculture, Nature and Food Quality presented its vision on the need to su support developments towards more sustainable agriculture. On how the Netherlands' knowledge, expertise and experience can contribute to achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Fighting hunger and the impact of climate change at the same time. And how we can boost economic prosperity, how to create jobs in rural areas to feed the rising population in rural and urban areas. Innovation and technology were defined as two of the key words. Shortly after the launch, launch of the Ministry's vision, we developed the campaign to show tell and brand Dutch agriculture and its achievements abroad under the name Farming the Future. Now, horticulture in the Netherlands is one of the sectors that has demonstrated how innovation and technology can make a difference. It starts with high quality seeds. Dutch seed companies cultivate more than 1,100 new plants, plant varieties each year, giving farmers and growers higher yields and better protection against pest and climate conditions. Greenhouses in the Netherlands are mostly concentrated in the Westland area, an area bigger than Manhattan, but still quite small in view of their production volume. But more interesting, thanks to the exchange of knowledge across the supply chain, these advanced methods for the production use less water, energy and raw materials than you would expect. A high-tech greenhouse can produce one kilo of tomatoes using just four liters of water. Compare that to the 60 liters needed in open field cultivation in many other countries. And these greenhouses nowadays actually produce more energy than they consume. The horticultural sector is contributing to many more fields than just the production of sustainable, healthy and tasty foods. They act in consortia with municipalities, research institutes, on how to feed the growing urban population. The Dutch horticulture sector is developing practical and easy to manage green concepts, focusing on the positive effects of a greener living environment on people. And these greener spaces are not the only effort made to preserve and restore biodiversity. The more variation of trees, plants, flowers and shrubs the more animals and insects these will attract. I'm always amazed by pollinating insects such as bumblebees, beetles and butterflies, but also amazed by the use of natural enemies and microorganisms to combat pests and plant diseases. And let us not forget the importance of education, vocational training, academic ambition, practical research. All contribute together with the activities of the Dutch business to the success of this sector. Together with the earlier mentioned innovation and technology, knowledge supports the Dutch drive towards a sustainable, where possible, circular agriculture. 
In countries where food security is under pressure, the Netherlands is ready to offer support by co-creating solutions to face the local challenges, by providing knowledge and technology across the value chain, ranging from restoring healthy soil conditions, improving distribution and storage to reduce food losses and food waste, and consumer engagement. And the Netherlands, whether it's companies, its knowledge institutes, or my own ministry, we are open for new or further cooperation with partners in other countries. Within the EU, working on the Green Deal and the Farm to Fork initiative. And of course, with the many partners outside of the EU worldwide. The Netherlands is your partner in horticulture. Finally, you may have noticed that an important element for the success and the development of many sectors in the Netherlands has been a strong cooperation between the private sector, knowledge institutes, and the public sector. Following the global crisis, the global financial crisis in 2008, these partners decided to join hands to stimulate innovation and investments. We call these public-private corporations our top sectors, a typical Dutch solution. And one of these top sectors is the horticultural and starting materials top sector. Having said that, I thank you for your attention and invite you to have a look at this top sector. Thank you very much. They make okay. us happy. They give us energy. They help us to grow as people, as a business, as a country. They feed many mouths nearby and far away. They inspire, they provide color and fragrance. They connect and they bring together. Our strength is to innovate, to make sustainable, to work together, to look beyond borders, to invest in solutions for now and the future. We co-create together with companies, knowledge institutions and governments. We have the knowledge to enable growth, the technology to make progress, the drive to offer opportunities, we have the willpower to improve, here in the Netherlands and worldwide. We are convinced that we can do more with less, that we can achieve more together with fewer natural resources. Innovating for here and for the world calls for sustainable solutions and smart technologies with consideration for our environment, with a passion for people, for our growth and our planet, and for the significance we have with all of our expertise, our training opportunities, our innovations and our international connections, now and in the future. We are top sector horticulture and starting materials. Every day, we are committed to green habitats, health, trade, economy, employment, energy, and of course, flowers. Top sector horticulture and starting materials, together towards a sustainable future. Together towards a sustainable future, farming the future, these are the themes which have come out of our opening uh, speeches and uh, what we've been discussing this morning already, as well as the Innovation Awards, and we really hope that you've seen that. If not, they're going to be available soon on demand. Now we're leading into a panel session entitled Farming the Future and Co-Creating, and I'm absolutely delighted to have a number of prestigious people from the Netherlands horticulture sector with me in the studio. I'm not going to give big introductions. Uh, you can read all about them online. But I'd like to go uh, firstly to uh, Sjak Bakker from Wageningen University and ask him for an opening statement about farming the future, Sjak. 
Well, farming the future for me is uh, doubling the production with half the inputs. As simple as that. It's simple as that. We'll come back to that in a moment. <laughs> Doubling the production with half the inputs. Okay. Secondly, if you saw the Innovation Awards, you've already seen uh, Lizalot de Vries from the Technical University of Delft. A warm welcome. What do you say about farming the future? Um, I would say if we were to achieve the SDGs, I would opt for some fundamental systems change. Fundamental systems change, which coming from Delft, I assume, has to do with research as well. Amongst others. Amongst others. Okay, we'll come to that as well in a moment. Staying on your side of the studio, we have from the Rabobank, Lambert van Horen. Hello, Lambert. Hello, Andrew. Greetings to you and your statement. Yeah, I'll stick to the Rabobank statement. Growing a better world together. Growing a better world together. And I would together. emphasize together. And the together part. Okay, we'll get into more details in just a moment. About furthest away from me in the studio here, it uh, feels like about 10 meters, is, uh, is Harry. Harry uh, Schmitz is from the Foundation for Fruit Tech. Farming the future, Harry, what does that mean to you? Thanks, uh, Andrew. For me, is farming the future is going to start with a decade of interoperable hoti tech, and not only thinking about it, but doing it. Action. Action. Speaks louder than words. We'll get to the words in a moment, and hopefully, There'll be lots of action in those words as well. Last but not least, we already met a little earlier the chairman of the top sector for horticulture and starting materials. That's <coughs> Mr. Yap Bond. Yap, your statement, farming the future. Uh, I think that the Netherlands is uh, the perfect partner uh, if you're looking for solutions for global challenges. The perfect partner right there. And you are someone, I think, who's going to demonstrate how to partner with the Netherlands uh, during the course of this, this panel session as well. Let's get back to, uh, to Shaq to start with. Uh, doubling productivity of existing farming. So you're not talking about inventing the wheel uh, newly, but also just uh, doing more with what we already have. Could you go into a bit more detail and explain that? Yeah, well, if you look to the potential of protected horticulture, it's, it's very large. I mean, uh, if you look to the productivity in terms of production and quality per area. It's, it's extremely high compared to open fields. So there's a lot of potential in the world using simple or uh, more uh, technology-driven uh, uh, production systems to improve the production uh, right now already. So it's for to solu the solution for the world is not only inventing the wheel or new systems, but also applying current systems around the world. So better greenhouses for better production? Yeah, and you should fit the greenhouse production system to the local conditions. I mean, we have a perfect greenhouse system designed for the Netherlands and for the Dutch conditions, but that doesn't necessarily mean it fits around the world. So you need to modify it to fit to the local conditions, and that it has a tremendous potential. Absolutely, thank you very much. We also heard the winner of the Sustainability Award here at Green Tech was all around water, um, a reverse osmosis system um, from the Van der Ender Group. And uh, of course, you know, if you're increasing productivity at the same time, it's about also saving resources. Very much. Protected horticulture gives you the opportunity to be much more resource efficient compared to open fields. Okay. Let me then come to Lambert and ask um, how we can make that bankable uh, before we're getting onto your statement. But we're talking about doubling productivity in existing infrastructure. Is that perhaps more difficult to get investment channeled towards than doing something completely new? Well, I would uh, look for new opportunities, of course, when you're looking at financing innovation. And financing innovation, uh, you need also a kind of creativity. So it's not looking for just a bank loan or just a credit, but it's looking for seed capital, for growth capital. And there are lots of opportunities right now because uh, in the current world, there is a lot of liquidity going on. There are a lot of investors. Uh, sometimes they, uh, well, they, they are maybe uh, people who are pensioned from, from horticulture, but they still have some capital and want to invest in this because they believe in, in what Shark said, in this improvement of sustainability. And so I think there are opportunities, but also in, let's say, in a financing business, you need innovation and you need co-creating. And talking about that co-creation, uh, there are certain barriers, which we're gonna to come to in more detail a bit later, but uh, particularly 
in terms of international cooperation on the financing side of things. It's not always an easy task to put a good, a good business case and financial case together, I understand. Now, uh, there are, of course, some limitations to international financing because sometimes you can't, uh, yeah, let's say, you have the currency topic, you have topics of uh, putting money from one country to another. That gives problems. There is a, maybe a tendency for more protectionism currently in the world. So, uh, it, yeah, also in this field, you need uh, innovations and creativity. So it's, it's it, what what Shark does at the university, etc. In, in more technological systems, you need also innovation in the financial system. And uh, well, we're, we're as, as Rabobank, of course, trying to do that because, well, we're, we're built uh, by farmers and by horticultural specialists, etc. Absolutely. And would you say that financing such uh, schemes and projects and initiatives uh, is a uh, is a major issue in terms of a financial gap for those projects? You were talking about people's desire to uh, to build more sustainable, um, a more sustainable world. Um, well, m maybe to, to uh, put it in another way, uh, Michiel also said in his introduction, you need cooperation on, on the triple helix, as we call it, uh, by government, by, let's say, knowledge institutions like universities, and also by uh, the companies in, in, well, and of, of course, banks are part of this, is this triple helix. And so you need this cooperation and uh, uh, working together also in the financial business and, and in how do we fund innovations. And I think, <coughs> for example, our bank has, a, has an innovation fund for new technology in horticulture. So uh, sometimes people um, looking for old solutions to finance new innovations, but also there you could see uh, used to, yeah, take the, the, the right step to uh, finance innovations. It's not all, always looking in the, in the old way. There's a lot, let me come to you and uh, maybe ask a little critically. Does this mean that you have a tremendous amount of finance coming in to uh, fund your basic research at the TU Delft? Maybe after today, um, at the moment, I would say not enough. I think there's a lot of innovation that is financed. Uh, of course, not enough, but there's before innovation, there's research and risk and failure. And those a little bit earlier uh, uh, projects, earlier innovation projects, they're risky. So if we were to change some fundamental things, I mean, we're doing great as a country, but we also still have a challenge, there's, there's not enough water, we use a lot of energy or, or gas. So there are some fundamental challenges. And how do we finance and, and collaborate in those earlier um, resource projects? So I, I would say there's not enough well, financing or, or cooperation there yet okay. to achieve those SDGs. Okay. I would challenge everyone to, uh, I don't have the money either, but I do feel we need to focus on that part too before uh, the, we reach the more innovative projects. Yap, let me come to you. It's a competitive advantage of the Netherlands to be very advanced when it comes to research, both uh, fundamental, if you like, early stage, yeah. as well as applied. Do you see uh, a massive problem in terms of the infeed of new innovations for, for the future? No, I, I think we, we, we have it well organized uh, in, in the Netherlands. Uh, things can always get better because uh, we evaluate our uh, uh, top sector. Uh, we do that every uh, four years. There will be elections in March, so uh, uh, maybe the program changes. Um, uh, and I would like to empathize that we don't start now. We are already, uh, for many years, we are uh, innovating and, and, and are uh, busy with the goals and the achievements and the challenges we have. And uh, that's why we have a, a top sector and, that, and we want to, to stay in that position that we will remain the best of the world. And uh, what I said in my opening speech uh, is that we uh, um, are able to, 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 to solve some uh, global challenges. Uh, we, we can take a main part in that. And, and that's where the research comes in. And I also mentioned the Triple Helix. It's a cooperation which is very unique. In Holland it's normal, but when other people come to normal, into Holland and see that cooperation between research, entrepreneurs and government, uh, that's a very unique position we have. So we have to strengthen it and uh, we have to evaluate uh, the, in what we invest as, as government. Uh, also private money, finding private money, because if an entrepreneur doesn't believe in it, it's very, very difficult to, to double the money, because that's what we do as top sector. 
But I think we have a good structure in Holland to, to, uh, to get innovation started. Let's talk to Harry in a moment about how to, uh, if you like, his, his view from a very practical side of things of how that innovation uh, hits the market, if you like, and uh, has perhaps some critical tones. There's a lot, let me come back to you quickly and talk about collaboration. Everybody talks about working together. And I think particularly from a university side, and uh, Shaq, if you want to chip in, uh, please do as well. That collaboration already happens with your research programs, with you have many uh, partners around the world, I guess, that you're working together with. Could you just explain that a little bit to us? Uh, we work with private sector companies and other universities or other knowledge institutes. And uh, I think that's the most interesting part. You work with the best partner uh, beyond borders. So that could be, uh, we are, as University Delft, uh, we're good in technological systems, which I've heard a couple of times that there's a need for improved technological systems. And we need uh, the experts in plant and production to, to uh, apply that to this industry otherwise. So we, lo we look for the best partners in, in plant and production, uh, which could be Wageningen, which could be companies, which could be a university abroad. And uh, we exchange personnel, for example, research staff or uh -huh. students to learn from this other university or this other company. Very much versa. about the knowledge economy. Exactly. Exchanging knowledge beyond borders of sectors or countries. Good. Shark, let me come to you then quickly and then we will go to Harry uh, so that he gets a word in here. Um, how do you reflect on, on that situation? Collaboration, basic research, financing, gap, question mark, not gap? Well, collaboration is, is key. And uh, especially for us as being a more applied research organization and also connected to the university, uh, we have a very close cooperation with the private sector in terms of the primary producers, but also with the supply industry, which is a very significant part of the total top sector, of course. Uh, so we have, our, uh, we have a group of about 70 um, uh, supply industry companies who cooperate with us on a business-to-business -business, uh, uh, scale, but also in a cooperative way on a more collective projects. Uh, addressing main issues for uh, for the sector. So what you see is that, uh, and uh, I would like to reflect on what Liz Lott says about uh, fundamental research. You see today more and more also for the more fundamental projects, uh, there is a, a minor part of private money requested to get it granted, which means that there will be slightly an influence of the uh, private sector and the needs of the private sector and the, and the top sector horticulture into uh, giving more direction for the fundamental research to deal with the uh, development goals. That's the helix coming together, yeah. basically. So that's, yeah. And uh, of course, we also have a quite a lot of uh, students coming uh, and uh, around and, and working together with us from around the world. Usually we have, at my unit only, we have something like 40 students coming uh, from around the world. And, and unfortunately, because of COVID, this has reduced very, very significantly. So I sincerely hope that it will be better uh, next year because it's one of the, the things which you see that uh, it's also knowledge exchanging uh, in the international field. And that's, I think it's very important to bring the knowledge we have in the Netherlands uh, around the world and you might discuss about whether it's good or bad. I think it's a good idea to spread the knowledge around the world and to, uh, to help the world feed the coming generations uh, as good as it uh, has been done over the last decades, of course. Thank you. Uh, Harry, a last. Thank you. Could you give us just a couple of details uh, on the Foundation for Fruit Tech? What is it you do exactly? Foundation for Fruit Tech Campus is a, a really triple helix organization. It's combining uh, uh, education and innovation in the Dutch uh, fruit uh, sector, apple, pears, soft fruit. It's a new uh, association. We funded it it's just beginning this year. But it's an example how you can make a combination to get the younger generation into our industry and help them or let them help us to innovate. And that I think it's a very strong uh, cooperative, which is driven by the big uh, cooperatives and growers in the Netherlands and apples and pears. And that's uh, a nice uh, way of looking into new kinds of innovation because innovation has to come very clear to the growers. 
Uh, and the proof of the pudding is in the eating for them. Uh, they have to see it. And the problem is if they don't see it, they don't want to use it because they have other things in mind, profit, loss, issues with their crops. Yep. So, and, and innovation, you have to show it. So on the one side, you have to do to deep dive research, and I'm convinced we have to do that. On the other side, you have to make it accessible for the growers to show them what's happening. And not only to show them what's happening in the Netherlands, let me be clear on that, but what also is happening around the globe. Uh, Chark now is a very easy project, this Food 4.0, that started by me, I think, four years ago, by bringing an, uh, a professor from Australia into the Netherlands and show the growers what's happening over there with robotics. And that started the thinking in our industry, hey guys, when that's happening on the tech side, how is that going to help us? Mm -hmm. that's, that's the, uh, it's amazing for those guys to see how technology is. When I, uh, I left uh, my uh, University of Applied Sciences and Horticulture in 85, ICT didn't exist. Eh? You know what I'm saying? <coughs> ICT mm -hmm. didn't exist. Eh? So I worked on the first personal one computer, the, the IBM PC-1. <laughs> that's that's the, the speed technology is changing our industry. Today, Shark is doing projects on autonomous growing, yeah. where the grower isn't needed anymore, and the computer is stealing the crop. Yeah. Yeah. And even he's going into single plant management on that computer. And that's the next level, not, not your greenhouse management, but single plant management in a greenhouse. Let me come back to your Australian uh, example. Yeah. So uh, Shaq was questioning whether you know, knowledge should be openly shared. That was just a question mark which was put in there. I think it's important to discuss it as well. So your Australian uh, colleague came. He shared his uh, knowledge of AI and robotization and what's going on there. What did he get out of that exchange? Uh, I, that is a nice example. In the week he was here, I visited with him some Dutch growers. And I had a talk with him at one of the, the biggest Dutch sweet pepper growers. And he asked to the guy, to the grower, where do you look at your plant? And then the grower stated 17 statements where he was looking at the top side of his plant, yeah. which was telling him if it was a good crop or not a good crop. Yeah. When he's asking that question in Australia, the grower was saying, I have 2,500 hectares, it looks green. Yeah. Yeah. So we have, in the Netherlands, we have the best growers to make their knowledge and transform them with AI and censoring and all kinds of technology into the use of that technology. Yeah. So it's an opportunity because for him to push the boundaries of his own ideas and, yeah, and innovation. Yeah, because he, he needs that knowledge. I talk a lot with startups, also in other programs I'm doing, and they all come to the Netherlands. Why? Every investor in the world says, when you, when you have a good solution, then you can sell it in the Netherlands. And if it's not sold in the Netherlands... It won't sell anywhere. It won't sell. It, it's nothing. So yeah. that's the, the other way around. We have the best growers. Yeah. It's yeah. amazable how those guys know their crops yeah. uh, on leaf level. Uh, for instance, they even look into the stomata by, uh, by saying. And that's how deep they are. And we have to realize ourselves that when we combine that with new tech, we have the big opportunity. But we have to realize ourselves that new tech is coming from Silicon Valley. Yeah. It's coming from Australia. Yeah, it's coming in our industry from Israel on this moment. Eh? Big projects in Israel are going on, especially AI. It's coming from other countries in the globe. So we have to open up for that, because if we don't open up for that, we can have the best growers, but we cannot bring them, connect them to the best technology. Mm -hmm. And that's our challenge. Yeah. Yarp, how do you see that international collaboration that Harry is talking about? And in the context of, you know, what is the mutual benefit, not only a one-way benefit, but the mutual benefit of exchange? Well, I totally agree. Um, uh, that's why we have a top sector, uh, horticulture. Uh, but there's one thing I want li would like to mention, there's a level playing field. Uh, because we, we have to have a level playing field uh, in, in, the, in the Netherlands uh, to keep it the top sector. When I, when, I, when I mention crisper grass, everyone nods yes, because that's an issue. And if you want to, st to, to stay the best in the world, uh, then we have to uh, arrange a, a level playing field yeah. so that we can, um, can level up uh, with others uh, and, and, and stay the best at, at what we are now. Um, 
So I think that's essential. And how do we get to a level playing field? That's politics. Yeah. The European Union has to decide on that. And I think that uh, the two Nobel Prize winners will give a big push in the right direction because I think we, uh, we need it. Uh, it's essential to make the next step. Explain your hope in that context. What will they bring? Uh, they will bring new technologies. Artificial intelligence is mentioned, uh, but it's also, uh, we, we need it to, to make new breeds. Um, and to do that, to do it on, on, on the right way. Uh, so um, that's why it's, 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 uh, it's very important that the Dutch um, the starting way. material uh, uh, companies uh, get the same possibilities as their uh, colleagues in the other companies around the world. Harry? There are all already crispr cress tomato plants, which are 20 centimeters high, mm. which can be green and grown in a vertical farm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But it's crispr cress technology, so we are not allowed to use it. Yeah. Yeah. How strange. are we going to speed up our crops yeah. for vertical farming? Yeah. How are we going to speed up our crops for robotics, because robotics need other crops. How are we going to speed up our crops for autonomous growing? Yeah, we make the combination of it. How do we get the knowledge? Yeah. And that's why we have to have a level playing field on technology to make those things happen. Yep. Because otherwise, yeah. We will lose it. Lambert, let me come to you on that point if I can. Uh, you probably won't be able to talk about your, uh, your official position to IP protectionism, if you like, but tell me about bankable innovation and how difficult this challenge is uh, when it comes to being open, being able to use certain technologies uh, versus, uh, you know, having a closed system. Yeah, there are some aspects to it, of course. One is politics, what Jaap already said. There's no level playing field in, let's say, jurisdiction in, in financing either. So it's not only technology a level playing field, but also in, in financing, etc. There are differences between, let's say, United States and the European Union or Australia or other uh, continents. So that's one aspect. But I, I really want to ma make this positive contribution, like the last Nobel Prizes for CRISPR-Cas on one hand and the World Food Programme on the other. Well, combine those two and you have this new, new future, you could say. And uh, if you look at what, what the universities are doing on uh, what Harry also, also said on, let's say, one plant, uh, growing one plant and knowing what's going on there. And you can also, uh, uh, let's say, expand that knowledge from that one plant to, to the cash crops to uh, corn, to rice, to wheat, etc. then you make an, uh, a great contribution with your protected horticulture to, let's say, cash crops and to the World Food, food Program. So it's, it's both the Nobel Prizes who are co-creating a better future, or, or let's say the, the knowledge of those, uh, etc. And um, yeah, your, your question was a little bit different, I know, and I see that in your... <laughs> uh, uh, I would back. have got to it. Ah, yeah, 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 <laughs> for sure. You, you, would, you, you would have uh, asked me again how to finance all the, this, this yeah, new uh, initiatives. And I think it's, it's, it, it's not about the, the finance, it's not the start, it's about the idea. And it's about, uh, let's say, telling what's your idea. And I think there are a lot of people uh, very uh, interested and very enthusiastic if you have a good idea. And there are a lot of, let's say, uh, seed capital congresses, etc. And there are a lot of people going to and, and organized by, by our bank, for example. And let's say the, the, the one who, who's believing in that idea uh, uh, well, he, he, he get in contact with the one who has the idea. But I think in this also you have to say that uh, sometimes it, you're faster when you're moving alone, but it's better to, uh, to travel uh, yeah. together get to the future. Let me come back to the universities, if I may, and just ask firstly a lot, how do you, uh, you know, ignite a spark in the rest of the supply chain when a great idea is, is coming out of your your research programs and the work which you're doing? I mean, how do you communicate it? How do you actually engage? Do you just send Joppe an email and say, here, get on with it? I mean, 
Uh, I will do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I think I'm lucky to work for the Technical University Delft, where every day bright minds come up with super cool ideas. Uh, we, we have drones flying around, robots racing around. Uh, so we don't have to sell the idea actually, which is a luxury position. And uh, we experience a lot of enthusiastic response from this industry as well. The challenge though is actually applying it to this interest industry and the co-financing that's sometimes needed. Sometimes it's clear that it's uh, valuable to a certain company. Sometimes it's not so clear because it's not that far yet and there's a certain risk in invest investment which is normal but how do how do we uh, facilitate that so but investors are looking for more mature uh, yeah. solutions yeah an idea is not always uh, trl proven, levels uh, proven, a little bit uh, a little bit higher is that is that right yeah Lambert? So, uh, um, maybe for every stage in your capital needs that you need another investor yeah. so if you if you looking for seed capital well, you need sometimes another investor than uh, if you're looking for growth capital, yeah. or let's say if you're a mature company, then you're just going for a bank, bank loan. So every stage needs another investment or an investor. Mm. Uh, I would say that. So uh, especially when you have young startups with, with, let's say, not connected to, to large companies or so, they uh, sometimes, yeah, well, aren't aware of this difference in, in how do you finance the different uh, stages of the innovation. So the seed capital is, is really something else than the mature, uh, yeah, mature companies. Jacques, tell us um, a percentage of the great ideas that you see coming from a very early stage that you see later in the marketplace and say, I recognize this. Any idea what the percentage of success rate might be? Or, and then to the second question, how do, you, uh, how do you stimulate people to get engaged? I find it's very difficult to answer because what you see in the, in the horticulture sector are a lot of things which have been the result of a, a long ongoing programs in research, development, etc. And everybody considers it its own ID, but it's not true. Somewhere in, let's say, 25, 30 years ago, somebody had an ID start working on it and sometimes it was blocked and then later on picked up again and so it took sometimes it takes I usually uh, uh, use the rule of thumb that when we start something in research it takes at least 10 years before it's implemented in the horticulture okay. sector wow. and I agree an idea is not an invention an, an, an invention is not an innovation an idea is not an innovation innovation is ready when it's being implemented on a certain scale yep in the practical horticulture sector. I see we have some questions that have come in from our audience. So thank you very much, firstly, to the audience. And uh, one of them comes back to the level playing field, in this case, on genetics. If we want a level playing field on genetics, how do we get there? And I have no idea who's best equipped to uh, answer that from our panel. So somebody please raise their hand. <laughs> well, I think it starts in the European yep. Parliament. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because this is a matter of politics, as I already mentioned. Uh, that's where it starts. Um, um, it, it's very actual now that the, 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 the document of Timmerman from farm to fork, uh, yes, they are working on it now. Um, and I think it's a little bit dated on mm. some uh, points. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's not a, a piece which, go, which goes for the future, but it's, it's a, a piece that's in the past. Uh, when there's a goal that we, they, they want to have 25% uh, biologic, and I think, oh, and what's about the circular agriculture? We are one step ahead. Uh, so the, the, that, that document is taking us back on, on some points. So that's also a political issue. And I think that the European Parliament is, uh, um, yeah, that, that, that's where it starts when it comes to uh, European ambitions. And then I think the Netherlands can adopt some global challenges. I think that's a much better way of working uh, then walking behind the facts every time. Uh, we have some uh, beautiful examples. Our Seed Valley companies, our starting material com companies, they are the best in the world. 40% of what grows on vegetables is created there. So give that to us. <laughs> we will take the responsibility. I, I but give us a level playing field. Harry is nodding his head a lot no, and I agree. agree. I agree with Jaap because I have a total different example. Hmm. 
I know that uh, on this moment there are new databases built for especially the data of chemicals, eh? pesticides yeah. and things like that. The European Commission is now building databases with PDFs. Yeah. That's, yeah. Our industry is on machine to machine connection. Yeah. That's not a PDF. No. And, let that, me, and, let and, me move and then they take five years to build that. Eh? Yes, exactly. And then they say to us, we, can, we are not allowed to use Google or Amazon to make connections of those data. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. The industry will move on. That will put us ahead. So not only food 4.0, we need politics 4.0 as well. Yeah. yeah. OK. They have to facilitate. Yeah. Harry, let me uh, just um, come back to you in terms of feeding I hope you're the right person to answer this, feeding the politicians with enough input for them to be able to make very considered and wise policy calls. Could you help us understand how that happens or would it be better for, for Yab to address that? Yeah, I want to make a statement on that. It's always important that people are aware and known of what the industry is moving on. And let us be clear that we are a very high tech industry and uh, it doesn't matter that a lot of people think, let me give you an example. I was Friday on a session of the Ministry of Agriculture with Michiel on uh, the mission to South Africa. I don't know if you hear about that, there was a digital mission. And that's for me a low tech country. But if I see how much South Africa on this moment already is doing with drones and things like that for drought management yeah. and for et cetera, et cetera, it's a high-tech application in a low-tech country. Mm. So you, it, there is no high-tech or low-tech. So the question is that politics have to realize that a lot of what they do has to be combined with this technology. Yeah? That's the interoperability of things. Yeah? For instance, let me give you a nice example. We did some research. Wageningen did beautiful research for me for one of my programs, Fresh Upstream, on data connection. We are clear that when a consumer goes into a store, that he can scan the barcode and he knows exactly what's in the product. Right? Yep. Go to a farmer, ask him to scan the barcode of a chemical, and then get somewhere the data which is in that chemical. Nada. Nada. And that's where it's starting. Eh? Starting on bringing connections and that data they need, yeah. they are coming from the ministry, they are coming from the, the producers of the chemicals, they are coming from research institutes, but they are not digitally connected. So, and on the consumer side, we think that's normal. Yeah. And on the, on the farmer side, we think it's normal that that guy has to read that label on that box, eh? Because he can scan the barcode, his sprayer knows what's in it, his management systems know what's in it. So it can be a very interoperable uh, development. Good. That is for me an example. Thank you. We have two more questions. I'm going to go uh, jump, them, jump them together. Um, the first one was all around the area of foreign inner investment within the Netherlands. Uh, Lambert, I'm going to ask you to comment on that. Is that a good thing, a bad thing? Do you need it? Do you not need it? And the second question which we have, uh, so that was the question from um, Mr. Young at home or in the office, thank you very much. And the second question from Ms. De Witt, is there enough money for innovation in the Netherlands, especially when it comes to applied research? Let's come to, to Harry perhaps on that or to, to Shaq. Uh, we heard about a special fund of some kind. Can you tell us more about that? So whilst Lambert is thinking about foreign investment in the Netherlands, Shaq, Harry, would you like to comment on Mrs. De Witt's question. Of course, there's not enough money. There's never enough money. <laughs> no, but it's that. No, of course, it's. Uh, I think the top sector and the approach we have in the Netherlands is is uh, a good one, where the need from the private sector is leading where applied research is done. So influencing uh, the, the the projects we do. Uh, by the, the money stream is one thing. And the nice thing in the Netherlands is that it's combined with policy-driven research and, and policy-driven topics. So that in the end, the results are not only uh, taken by the, by the industry to be applied, but it also fits in the government policy. So it's, there's no barrier then for the application. 
And, uh, and th the second part of the question was, we heard about a special fund. I would like to know what it is because <laughs> it could be anything. There are, uh, there are a range of funds uh, available for applied research uh, coming from different ministries. So um, it's hard to answer uh, without knowing exactly what, uh, what they mean. But there is money available for applied research and of course, I'm part of the Applied Research Organization, and of course we can need, always we can need more money to also uh, do projects in cooperation with the private sector. But yeah, there is not an unlimited source of money, and it's a political decision on where the money streams go. And I think that uh, we need to work with the restrictions we have uh, the best we can, so it's not only Horticulture, which is the best in efficiency around the world, I believe that also our research organizations are very, very efficient. If you look to the limited money stream we get and the results we are able to, uh, to create. So I really think that uh, the, the knowledge system in the Netherlands with universities and applied research organizations like ourselves, it's a very good example of how it could be organized around the world. And that's what you, what you see around the world. There's a tremendous missing link between the universities and the private sector. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna to go to Lambert now about foreign investment in the Netherlands, and we have another question coming in. And then we're gonna talk a little bit more about talent. Yeah, if we look at our products, let's say 70 to 80% of horticultural products <coughs> are exported. Uh, most of it to European countries, to European Union, but several also uh, uh, to other continents, especially uh, the seed or propagation material. And uh, well, why, why should we be surprised when a foreign investor comes to the Netherlands then? So uh, I would say, well, we, we have an open economy. We're trading with a lot of countries everywhere in the world. So uh, trading also means financing. That's, that's part of the business. If, if, you, if you want to earn money uh, from, from German customers, from UK customers, from, from French customers or whatever, uh, why should you be surprised that that's someone from Germany or from France or even from the United States or Australia wants to invest in the Netherlands? I would say, yeah, I, I don't see the, the, the danger in it, let's say. I and of course you can look at intellectual property, et cetera, yes, and, and the, the, let's say the people who, who are maybe, uh, um, well, they, they are scared about that the intellectual property goes to everywhere in the world. But uh, I think that's also politics. That's a level playing field. That also in your intellectual property, there's a level playing field. And that breeder rights are respected or that uh, uh, patents are respected, etc. So that's maybe the answer to that question, uh, Andrew. Thank you. Andrew, I, I want to react yeah, on that. Let's, that's let's, what Green Tech is about. Just a second, Harry. Yep. Uh, yeah, bring, meeting new partners, bringing these and partners business together, to business and bringing them together, and, and trading, and, 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 trading, and trading. Of course, it's, it's, that's what Green Tech is about. Yep. Harry, I think it's wrong thinking that the money has to come from the Netherlands. The Netherlands is a city state, like Priva, uh, Mani Prince often says. Eh? It's not more than a big city. Mm -hmm. uh, our, our strawberry industry, which is the best in the world in greenhouses, and Shark knows that, is 400 hectares or something like that. That is less than one company of Driscolls. Yeah. So be aware that we are a small city state and the money is there on the globe. And you see Panasonic is stepping into robots, Denso is stepping into robots, Google is stepping into robots. There are big international tech companies are stepping into our industry. But we should be standing open to accept that and don't say, yeah, we don't have the money. We have to realize we never get the money because I think one robot is my statement, is taking 10 million euros to develop. There is no ag tech company in the Netherlands who can finance that from their basics. Very clear messages. Thank you. We have a question from Aaron Banerjee. Aaron, thank you very much for that. What are the commercial challenges with vertical farming? And can we expect uh, carbon credits because of their uh, obvious efficiency improvements for vertical farms and for smart greenhouses? So maybe that could help the commercial case as well. Uh, I don't know, Lambert, would you like to take a shot at that? Yeah, maybe to start with, I don't see the, the let's say, the way to, to create this 
uh, opposition side of vertical farming and greenhouses. In my way, a vertical farm is, is just a more improved or a more sophisticated greenhouse uh, where you can uh, do anything with your light, etc. And let's say stack growing in in uh, in, in Brussels sprout uh, in the. Uh, in the uh, endive, uh, Brussels endive, or in, in mushrooms, or in other, or in tulip, tulips, etc. We that's we have outrageous. that for years. Yeah. So there's no opposition between those two systems. So it's I think Shark uh, started with this statement. It's about the efficiency of your inputs, and so if, if of your chemicals or, or if your uh, fertilizer, etc., or your water, and and you have to look for the right system for the right place anywhere in the world and that could be different because here we have high tech in a city state and in some other countries we have let's say more low tech and more maybe a, a, a foley greenhouse and not a uh, plastic greenhouse. Lambert so, you've avoided the question slightly again so I'm <coughs> going to yeah. come back to carbon credits is that a way of maybe helping the commercial viability of advanced greenhouses and and vertical farms? Yeah in, in general briefly. let's say if you if you are pricing carbon that that could be something to uh, to promote more sophisticated and more efficient input yeah. utilization yeah so that that could be uh, I, I think you uh, i want to more generalize this question understood we're going to go a lot into greenhouse technologies and vertical farms in the course of all the presentations which we've got coming up here in the main stage before we go to Yab for some final sort of conclusions, if you like. I'd like to come back to talent, and I'd like to ask, uh, particularly in the Delft direction, um, whether it is easy enough to attract people into the industry, um, whether you have you know, uh, more students potentially knocking on your doors for bachelor's, master's, doctorates uh, than you can handle, and uh, you know, is it an attractive sector to be working in, also from a personal perspective? Personal perspective, definitely yes, otherwise I would not be sitting here. Um, attracting students, definitely in this online uh, day and age, I think is, is very going really, no, it's going really well. I going well? Say. Yeah, Good. for our university and I think for Wageningen as well. Um, I would challenge the industry to take up more technically schools or uh, university schools staff and maybe we can then t together tackle those technical challenges so I don't think the talent uh, development is, is, is a problem at all uh, also the the Asian countries visit our university and they they apply um, so I expect a large interest of our students for technical challenges in this industry excellent anybody like to comment on that Harry? Yeah, I like to comment. I think it's, uh, it's clear for our industry we need new people. Yeah. And we need people who have, have the first, especially the food tech campus. The first uh, education round we started is a food uh, education uh, setup with 30% technology. Because our industry needs more people who think technology. I will give you a nice example. Uh, on Food Masters, they implemented a new robot for the packing station. And after six weeks, somebody said, why did the robot get a break? <laughs> because when the people go to break, they, they, they put down the robot. And then somebody said, that's not needed anymore. <laughs> so we need, we need that, that social innovation, that new people who start thinking in our industry, who, who can work with autonomous growing, we can work yeah. with vertical farming, we can think like robots are acting. And so we have to, and that's what I like on the AgTech Institute, to make the combination between green and gray. Uh, between the iron side of our industry and uh, the fact that we have those things. Let me be clear that vertical farming and autonomous growing was a success because of the plant research and the plant models uh, were done by Shark in the 60s already. Eh? That's where they started using the modeling technology on crop model management. And, and that's, but we, have, we need guys who can bring that traditional research into technology. And bring it into the field. Excellent. Yab, you've heard all about that. I would like you to give us a final word on behalf of the whole panel as everything comes together into the top sector. Very challenging about some of the points that were made here. Level playing field when it comes to IP. Level playing field when it comes to financing opportunities. Talent. Uh, investment in basic research. And then the export question. Only products? 
products and starting materials, products and starting materials and knowledge, question mark. Yeah. You mentioned One some, you you mentioned some conditions, <laughs> uh, so I will not uh, elaborate on that. But what I will uh, state is that we have great infrastructure. Uh, we have a great amount of knowledge. And uh, that's what I say in my opening speech, and that's what you see here uh, in this panel. Uh, that if we work together, we can, um, uh, we can achieve the challenges which lays ahead of them. And, and those are not, not small challenges, they are global. Um, so we see opportunities in the Dutch for cooperation. We are able to contribute in knowledge and expertise. Um, and that's uh, the government, that's the entrepreneurs, and that's also the research. We have it, we have the infrastructure. So everybody is welcome to join us and to roll up the sleeves and to achieve the global uh, achieve challenges that lays ahead of us. I think we are able to, uh, to do that together. Perfect closing words, Liz a lot. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us. And uh, we're going to take a very short break before our next presentation, which will start in about 10 minutes' time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.